In this episode, we won't be coding. Instead, I will be talking about the history of programming and I will be trying to give you this bigger picture, this deeper understanding into Flutter and the ideas around it. Why it's done the way it is and why we decided to do certain things the way we did. And I hope this historical context will clarify certain things. Especially that I received some comments and I would like to address one of those comments because I, I promise I will. Let me show you the comment. It's a comment by Sweng Sueng Juan Jiong. I'm sorry if I pronounce it <clears throat> wrong. So I believe it's a Korean name. Seung Hwan asks if we should really rebuild the text field each time it changes. Is, is it really efficient? He's worried that we are doing it too often. I will try to address that question today. So let's go back to our code. As you remember, here we have this compose new message window. We have reactive text fields. And before we created this class, this wrapper, this abstraction around the stream builder, we had two clear separate paths. The first path was to rebuild the text field whenever there is a new value in the text field, so whenever someone types something. And the second path was when there was, there was an error. So something happened like a validation error and we had to not only rebuild the text field, but display an error message below. So we had this condition, we had this observer. So on success, we were building the field without an error. And on error, we were, we were building the same field, rebuilding the same field with the error below. And isn't it inefficient? Well, actually, it, it's not. It's... Uh, the way it should be done. Because in Flutter, we have this concept of reactive widgets, which means, so reactive has many meanings, and I, want, I don't want to now discuss it and happen to dive into the subject, you will see that reactive may mean something completely different in different contexts. In this particular context, in this application, and in the context of Flutter, it means that we are rebuilding widgets whenever there is a change. There is this another concept called one-way data flow, which comes from React, which means that we have the data, the state, which is the, the source of truth. And based on that, we are building our screen, our view, so our widgets. And it flows one way from data to the actual display. And then the changes are propagated back to the state differently, not through the same uh, path, so to speak. There is always data and then the view. So whenever data changes, the view is rebuilt. And the idea is to do, to rebuild it in an, in an efficient way. So in React, there is this concept of virtual DOM and of, of diffing. So you try to see what changed and then you try to only apply the changes on a, on a subset of your view so that it's efficient. And why I say this is a good, good idea and this is the natural way of doing things is because Dart, the programming language that is used in Flutter, was designed for this sort of applications. So it has a garbage collector which is optimized for short-lived objects, which means that whenever you are rebuilding your widget, whether it's a text field or anything else, this widget is, um, is short-lived because we, we can rebuild it. And Dart, its, its mechanisms are designed the way that it can handle that in an efficient way. So you shouldn't be worried about that because Dart solves that for you and you should build your applications this way. And why is that? Because one-way data flow is easier to think about. You have only one path, which is the path of displaying things, of rendering things. You don't have this additional path of updating things right? Because you're always creating your widgets from the scratch. And even if you have this condition or, or these two separate paths, one path for 
actual text field and another one for the same text field with an error, it doesn't really matter because conceptually it's just easier this way. You have data, in this case, in this like separate context, it's a stream. If stream generates a value, it means it's a text field with this value inside that text field. If it's an error, it means that it's a text field with an error message below. And it's just easier to think about the whole flow this way. The data changes and we just remove what we had and we rebuild the widgets that need to be rebuilt. And it's not only Flutter, but the Dart below that's designed to handle this way of thinking about building applications. Things like a provider or any other things that put together state and widgets are not really in the spirit of uh, Dart, in the spirit of Flutter. I think those should be separated and that's the reason we have our widget tree separated. And then we have our managers or whatever you call them, you, you can, as long as it's separated, we have those two worlds separated one from another. And if the data changes, we just rebuild the application, like the, the part that needs to be rebuilt. And we don't have to worry if it's efficient or not, because that's handled on the, on the very low level, not only by the framework, but by the language itself. But you don't have to trust me. And I would like we do some reaction video and we will be listening to a part of a podcast. So I really like this podcast. I recommend you, you check it out. It's called Software Engineering Daily. And there was an episode uh, almost, well, exactly, almost exactly one year ago, more than a year ago, an interview with Eric Seidel, which is one of the creators of Flutter. And it's an extremely interesting interview. And I would like we just listen to a part of it where Eric talks about the advantages of Dart, why Flutter uses Dart. So let's just do this reaction and let's listen to this short part together. What is the benefit of using the Dart language? So there's a, a bunch of nice properties of Dart. We talk some about this on our, our website at our uh, Frequently Asked Questions. So one of the nice properties of Dart is that it has a really fast garbage collector. One of the really fast garbage collector. The choices that we made in Flutter was to have this reactive uh, style system where it's very common to allocate uh, thousands of objects in a, if not tens of thousands of objects in a single frame. So in a thousands of objects in a single frame, it's designed this way. So you shouldn't be worried about that in a span of a few milliseconds and then immediately let go of those objects again. And there's a variety of ways to do that, but Dart having a generational garbage collector can handle uh, large volumes of short-lived objects very quickly. Dart also has some uh, really nice performance characteristics. It has an ahead-of-time compiled backend, which allows us to compile straight to native ARM code, allows us to achieve really fast startup uh, and really consistent performance. And Dart also has a nice focus on developer experience, uh, which really got along well with my team. Yeah, so th there you have it. The, the three reasons and uh, the first one is, I think, the most important in the context of this episode. You should remember that the system is designed this way, that you should prefer one-way data flow. You have your data, you have your state, and then you regenerate your objects, your widgets. And even if there are thousands, tens of thousands of those objects, Flutter and Dart, they can make it in the very quickly. So that's not a problem. It only makes designing and thinking about your state and your, your application easier. So before we go further, I would like to mention two other things in this because it's just reminded me some, had some ideas related to that. It's not very well known, but Dart was created by a guy named Lars Back. I think this person is really under appreciated. Not many people know Lars. And Lars is not only the creator of Dart, but he also created V8, the JavaScript runtime engine, which is also something remarkable in terms of software engineering. And before that, Lars was participating in creation of a language, programming language in the 90s, I believe, called Self. 
So self is this object-oriented programming language which, which has very interesting characteristics. It's based around prototypes. When I'm recruiting people, I always have this question, could you name, could you give me an example of, of an object-oriented programming language? And people usually say Java, Ruby, Python, and I say to them, well, Java is not really object-oriented. Python is not really object-oriented. Ruby is not object-oriented. And people always, <gasps> why? This question allows me to, you know, understand if people have this historical context. So self is object-oriented and small talk is object-oriented. Funny enough, Erlang is also object-oriented, but I won't explain today why. Maybe I will do a short vlog about this. I wanted to mention that so you have this bigger picture how things evolve. There is self, which was used as an inspiration for JavaScript. And there is this idea of prototypes. And then Lars, who created, who was participating, working at Sun, creating uh, self, went on. And at Google, he created V8, also something amazing in terms of software development. And then he created Dart, uh, which I also find quite impressive. And Dart has those nice characteristics because so Lars and there was another person, Casper, uh, they created Dart with those nice, nice characteristics which then can, could be used by Eric and other people to create Flutter. As you can see, it's, it's pretty interesting and knowing that, I think it will give you an advantage and you will be, you will have this bigger picture and you will know how Flutter or Dart applications were meant to be by using those, those advantages of those platforms, of those systems. If you know them, this could be then transferred to your application and you won't be doing something against the framework or against the language. Rebuilding widgets, it's not, it's encouraged. At the beginning, it may be counterintuitive, but in fact, it's encouraged because that's how it was designed. They wanted to help people do it easier conceptually. So it's one day data flow. So I encourage you to check those things, starting with self, which is a very like, prehistoric computer science um, thing. And then Lars and Casper Lund, I believe, and Eric Flutter. And we, we are here and Flutter in practice as a result of that, trying to build our email application. That's all for today. See you next time. Before you go, I would like to invite you to my newsletter. I'm not very active on social media and I think email is the best way to communicate. So if you'd like to stay up to date, I will be sending one email per week, Friday evening, with all the materials we did during that week and some additional ones as well, tips and tricks, articles. If you're interested, it'd be great to have you. See you next time.